in the previous few lectures we have been discussing about different kinds of medium scale integrated circuits or what we call as msi circuits and in particular we have looked at uh, two kinds of msi circuits which find considerable use in uh, digital system design one is multiplexer the other is decoder and we have seen their functioning and application and how we can use them for uh, different realizations of different kinds of logic functions let us in this lecture let us look at some other aspects of msi circuits one of those or rather the, the first one the first circuit which we are going to be seeing involves something called as a priority now what do we mean by priority suppose we have a combinational logic circuit with multiple inputs let us say at least two or three inputs so far we have seen that when we are designing circuits the inputs have different meanings they try to convey different uh, conditions or different variables which influence the functioning of the system that is under consideration so as such there is no difference between the inputs the output of the sister system that we see is some combination some logical combination of the inputs which are there and uh, in our yeah. current discussion we will talk about a certain msi block which makes use of priority wherein one of the inputs is given more priority than others and when there are multiple inputs to the system there is a priority order so the block that we are going to be discussing today is called as a priority encoder this is pretty useful wherein we can assign importance of uh inputs one over another so priority encoders you may you may question where would we use circuits which have uh, which have the concept of priority well there are several applications but before we discuss applications let us see what a priority encoder looks like so generally a priority encoder again is kind of like a like the opposite of a decoder where you have n number of outputs and 2 raised to n number of inputs so let us say if n is equal to 2 if n is equal to 2 then in that case we get what is called as a 4 is to 2 encoder so that means there are four inputs and two outputs let's say i have the inputs let's call them as i3 i2 i1 and i0 and here i have the outputs a and b now a decoder sorry an encoder essentially works in such a way where these inputs have a priority order so we can define the priority order in the following manner let us say 
I call I3 as most important and I0 as least important or I3 has highest priority, next I2, next I1 and then I0 has least priority. So this has highest priority. Alright, so now, how would this work? How would this decoder work? It works in such a way that when I3 becomes equal to 1, when I3 becomes equal to 1, it does not matter what is the value of I2, I1 and I0. And if I3 becomes equal to 1, A and B will carry some values whose combination will uniquely represent that there is a signal at I3 or the value of I3 is equal to 1. So the way it works, we can represent it in terms of a truth table. Now, suppose I3 becomes 1. If I3 becomes 1, as I mentioned, then it does not matter what I2, I1 and I0 are. We can consider them as don't cares. In that case, A and B will indicate a value that shows highest priority. So let us say A and B is 1, 1 because this is the highest possible two digit binary value. So 1, 1 indicates 3, which means I3 is currently active. Now I2 will be considered if and only if I3 is 0. Then if I2 becomes 1, if I2 becomes 1, I1 and I0 will be ignored because they are lower in the priority order. So then we can assign this value 1, 0, which indicates 2. Then if I3 and I2 are both 0, only then I1 will be considered and I0 will be ignored because I0 is still lower than I1 in the priority order. So here we can put 0, 1. Finally, when all the previous 3 are 0, then I0 will be considered if it is 1. So then this will be 0, 0. Now what happens if all are zeros? If now I0 becomes 0, in that case A and B will be don't cares. A and B will be don't cares. This is how it works. So now, if I were to represent this in the form of a complete truth table, it would look something like this. So when all are 0, A and B both are don't cares. Now as per the priority order, when I0 becomes 1 and the rest are 0, 
then A and B are both 0 and 0. Now, when I3 and I2 are both 0, I1 becomes 1, AB will be 0, 1, irrespective of what I0 is. Now, when I2 becomes 1 and I3 is 0, for these four cases, the values of I1 and I0 will not matter. A and B will be 1, 0. Now, this is easiest. When I3 becomes 1, it does not matter what I2, I1 and I0 are. AB will be 1, 1. That's all there is. So then, if you if you were to simplify A and B as functions of I3, I2, I1 and I0, they would look like this. So this will be a don't care. And rest will all be 1. So, a very easy way to solve this would be we can make two groups of 8, one group over here, the other group over here. So this don't care need not be considered. So in that case, uh, if we were to mark the axis, this is I3, I2, this will be I3 bar, I2 bar, this will be I3 bar, I2, then I3, I2, finally I3, I2 bar. So over here, then A will be equal to I2 plus I3. This is the answer. And for B, for B, the K-map would look like this. So we have 0, 1, 2 and 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 6 7 are all zeros and the rest of them will be all ones. This is what it looks like. So over here uh, we will have one group in this manner, the other group we can have a group of 4 in this manner. Once again, this particular don't care does not have to be grouped because all the ones are grouped. So, right, so over here B will be equal to um, here, this will be. I3 plus I1 I2 bar. That's what this will be. So, if we were to draw the circuit of a 4 is to 2 priority encoder, what it would look like essentially is something like this.
So A will be I3 odd with I2. So this will be A. For B, it will be I1 and I2 bar or with I3. That's it. And I0 will play absolutely no role. Likewise, just the way in which we saw how to work with and how to design a 4 is to 2 priority encoder, you can also you can also design an 8 is to 3 priority encoder. You can also design a 16 is to 4 priority encoder. And those I leave to you as an exercise to try it out in a manner that is very very similar to uh, the one we saw. Of course, in that case, it will not be so simple because the inputs will then become 8 and 16 and solving those kind of large logic functions would not be so easy. So therefore, from the point of view of simplicity, a 4 is to 2 encoder is quite straightforward. So, but in general, encoders having 8 is to 3 or 16 is to 4, they do exist. Because there are indeed techniques to simplify logic functions with more than 4 variables. Although it is beyond the scope of this course, they do exist. Now, the question is, as we had asked ourselves, towards the starting of the discussion. What kind of uh, what kind of applications are encoders used in? Or rather, where does the priority concept find application? This priority concept, where can it be applied? Well, it can be applied when you are looking at circuits where some kind of comparison is involved. Suppose you are saying that, let's say, there is some kind of a signal which needs to be converted into a digital form. An analog value has to be converted into a digital value. Then in that case, then in that case, I can say that well, one of the ways to convert that analog value into a digital value would be to first see what range of values it falls in. So therefore, if it falls within range 1, the lower ranges become unimportant. Suppose it does not fall in the highest range, we need to look at the next possible range. And the lower ranges then would become unimportant. So therefore, it is very similar to an example where if you go to a vegetable market and let's say the vegetable grocer is trying to weigh the vegetables that you have chosen using a beam balance. And let's say there are multiple standard weights, 1 kg, 500 grams, 250 grams, 100 grams and so on. Now the first thing that he would do if the quantity of the vegetables is very high is that while one of the arms of the balance would contain your vegetables, then on the other arm, the grocer would place a 1 kg uh, weight. And if, uh, if that works well and good, then the rest of the weights don't be, no, are not important. However, if the 1 kg becomes too heavy, then I will remove that and go for the 500 gram one. So, likewise, if you assume that the 
uh, if you assume that in this present scenario obviously you can see that uh, the 1 kg arm becoming heavier would mean that the actual weight of the vegetables is less than 1 kg. So then in that case the next weight he would try on would be the 500 gram and so on and so forth depending on uh, what combinations uh, suit the weight of the vegetables the closest. Of course this technique you will not see much these days because in contemporary times the use of digital scales is becoming much more uh, popular but internally something similar happens. So coming back to priority encoders they are used extensively in analog to digital converters. So there is, is a very special kind of analog to digital converter which is called as a flash converter. Then comes, as I mentioned, digital scales. Another application, although it may not be fully, fully clear at this point, but these kind of encoders are used extensively in microprocessors. Now, which part of the functioning of the processor is it used? Now, as you know, the processor is the heart of every computer, whether it's a mobile or whether it's a laptop or a desktop computer. The processor is a very integral part of the function. Now, a processor has to manage multiple tasks or multiple operations. Now, let us say the processor is doing its operations it has a number of resources to handle and there are two devices which need the processor's resources. Now then in that case, if the resources are being claimed by those two devices at the same time, the processor has to then decide to whom should I first provide the resources, to device A or device B. So then in that case, a priority order has to be established and there a priority encoder is used which helps the processor understand which of these devices should I give more priority. And those processes or, or those operations of the processors are called as interrupt handling. Where any device can interrupt the processor to stop, to make it stop what it is doing and hand over the resources that are required and this is a very important part of design of the processor. Now having said all this, let us go back and revisit one of the circuits which we have already seen quite a few lectures back and that is the concept of adders. We have already seen how we can use how we can use half adders or full adders to add binary bits. Now, if we have to convert that into a addition of two n bit binary numbers, we have already seen in one of the previous lectures how we can make use of half adders and full adders. To realize a n bit binary addition. So just as a quick recap, suppose I have two numbers of 4 bits A3, A2, A1 and A0. Then the next number is B3, B2, B1 and B0 and this two we have to add. So the first bit of the sum is A0. And the carry that is generated, let's call it C0, it goes to the next stage. Then C0 plus A1 plus B1 gives us the sum bit S1 and then the carry bit S1, C1 goes to the next stage. We get 
the sum bit s2 and the carry bit c2 goes over here and the sum bit essentially here becomes s3 and the remaining significant carry becomes c3. So the first stage of addition involves two bits. There is no carry. The next stage of addition becomes these three bits, then these three bits, and then these three bits. So for this, you can use a half adder, and for the remaining, you can use, or you have to use, full adders. Now, to maintain the uniformity, we can use a full adder for the first or the zeroth stage also. We can just assume that the carry is zero. So therefore, we can essentially show that over here, the full adder has inputs A0 and B0. And of course, there is no carry over here. So since we see that the carry is always coming from the previous stage, we will call this as C minus 1. In case there is any carry from previous stage, which is normally 0, over here we will get the sum that is S0. Now what will happen is that the carry output from this full adder, which is C0, will go to the next full adder, as we expect. So C0 will be added with A1 and B1 bits. So A1, B1 and C0 will be added and the output bit will be S1 and the carry bit will go to the next stage that is C1. Now C1 will be added with bits A2 and B2 and the output will be S2. Finally, the carry bit from this 2th stage will be C2 and that will be added in the next full adder with bits A3 and B3. The sum output will be S3 and the carry output will be the final C3. So as we have, we have discussed this configuration already in the previous lecture, in one of the previous classes and this configuration is called as a ripple carry adder. Now why are we talking? Of ripple carry adders when we are already familiar with. The reason I am talking about the ripple carry adder is because although it looks like a very nice and simple way through which you can calculate the sum of two four bit binary numbers, the reality is not as, as beautiful as it may seem. So, so, why am I saying that there is a problem? Let us look at the 0th stage. Let's call it as 0th, 1th, 2th and 3th. So, if there is no carry from the previous addition, which is usually the case, then A0 plus B0 will give you S0 and C0. Now, remember, when we are doing any kind of binary addition or rather when the computer has to do any kind of binary addition, the bits A3, A2, A1, A0 and B3, B2, B1, B0 are normally available all the time because they are the input bits. Now while the first addition is taking place, that is in the 0th stage, when the 0th stage addition is taking place, remember that this addition is done using logic gates. 
we have already proved that a full adder can be made using XOR gates, AND gates, OR gates and so on. When we look at the 1x stage, we see that A1 and B1 are already there. A1 and B1 are already there. So we can actually start the addition. But can we do it? No. We also need C0 from the previous stage. And C0 will take some time because all the logic gates inside the full adders, they are never ever actually ideal gates in practice. They need a very small amount of time to reflect the outputs after receiving the inputs. Although we have, we have been discussing about ideal gates so far in our discussion, in this course, ideal gates exist only in textbooks. In practice, things are never ideal. Now, this is the problem in stage 1. In stage 2 again, A2 and B2 are ready. But the problem is C1 is not ready. And in turn, C1 will depend on C0. So therefore, let us say the delay or the time taken to generate T0 or sorry, to generate C0 by this full adder, let's say the time taken is some TD, which means delay time. In that case, then C1 will take 2TD because there are two full adders. Likewise, C2 will take 3TD. So it's like saying C3 will be ready only after 4TD. Likewise with the sums. The sums will be delayed, the sum bits will be delayed and the carry bits will be delayed. Therefore, this chain reaction where the carry bits essentially take time This is a big problem. So as we try to add more and more number of bits, as we try to add more and more number of bits, the time taken increases linearly. Now that is disastrous. In modern day computers, four bits are no longer used. Computers make these days use of at least 32 bits or 64 bits. Now if every each individual bit stage takes time TD, the net addition time will be something like 32 TD or 64 TD which may be very very large. So that is something which is undesirable. That is something which is undesirable. Let us try to understand how. Let us try to understand how this delay is actually working. Let us now consider the ith stage or the ith full adder. Now what is the input to the ith full adder? The inputs, the inputs are ai, bi and ci minus 1. Because if you consider i equal to 2, you will see inputs are a2, b2 and c1. And the outputs. The outputs are SI and CI. So therefore, let us try to establish a relation between or let us rewrite the relation between the inputs and the outputs. So as we saw, as we saw, The inputs to the ith stage full adder is ai, bi and ci minus 1. The outputs are si and ci. So you will recall from one of the previous lectures where we discussed about full adder, we saw that the sum output essentially is this ai xor bi xor ci and sorry ci minus 1 i'm sorry 
whereas C i is A i B i plus B i C i minus 1 plus C i minus 1 A i. So therefore, having having represented these sum and carry outputs, let us try to show the carry output of each stage using logic gates. By now we know that the villain in the ripple carry adder is the carry bit because this is what has to go from one stage to other stage. The sum is not a problem because the sum is available individually at every stage. It does not have to go to the next stage. Remember, it is the carry which is propagating. The sum does not have to propagate. So therefore, if I now look at the carry and I try to represent that carry using basic gates, what I will get? So, you will have, so essentially there are three inputs, AI, BI and CI minus 1. And we will have an OR gate to combine. So this is CI. Now this CI has to go to the next stage. So over here again we will have three gates where the inputs will be corresponding to the i plus 1th stage. A i plus 1, B i plus 1, B i plus 1, C i. Now this C i will come from the previous stage. And C i, A i plus 1. Again, we will have an OR gate. This output will be C i plus 1. Now suppose we consider i equal to 0. Then how many gate stages are there between the inputs and C i? This is one stage. You have three identical gates. And then all these outputs are combined using this OR gate. So we will call this as stage 2. These will have one delay, this will have another delay. So CI, the delay is corresponding to two stage delay. Now, what about CI plus 1? Again, we have this stage 1 and stage 2. But is that all there is? No. If I is 0, I plus 1 will be 1. For CI plus 1, the stage 1 itself has an input of CI. The stage 1 itself has an input of CI. And the CI is coming from the previous stage. Now already there is a two stage delay for CI which is coming over here. And further you have these two stages. Stage, let's call this a stage 1 and stage 2. So the net delay for CI plus 1 will be stage 1 over here, stage 2 over here, again stage 1 over here, stage 2 over here. 
So by the time we can expect the correct value of C i plus 1, the delay would be 4 stage delay. So if you consider the net delay of two stages as TD, here also if you consider TD, the delay over here will be TD and here it will be 2TD. This is what we had discussed just a few minutes back using those full adder blocks as a reference. Only difference is in this case, I showed you how we can delve more into the circuit in the circuit level of the full adder chain and see how these delays are being manifested. How these delays are being manifested. Now, the fact of the matter is that this delay is disastrous, especially when number of bits involved in the addition are very, very large. Generally, let us say the delay of each, each stage can be as much as one nanosecond, for example, even here it's one nanosecond. This is also one nanosecond. This is also one nanosecond. So therefore, TD will be actually equal to two nanoseconds. 2TD will be equal to 4 nanoseconds. So, in that case, 64TD will be equal to 128 nanoseconds. That means, although a nanosecond is very, very small, 128 nanoseconds is quite large. It will severely put a limitation on the speed of your addition. So therefore, therefore, what did we see today? In this particular lecture, we saw that indeed in case of the ripple carry adder or where there's a chain of full adders, the culprit or the villain is the carry bit because the carry bit is the carry output from the full adder, which is going as input to the next full adder. So therefore, while the other inputs, the AI and BI are ready at all times, every stage has to wait until the CI minus one from the previous stage is coming or it's ready. Otherwise the output will be incorrect. So if let us say I am giving two 64 bit numbers, I have to wait for 128 nanoseconds to get the proper answer and that is a lot. It may not seem a lot to a human being, but it's a lot for a computer. So therefore, the question comes, can something be done to reduce this delay? Can something be done to reduce this delay in the carry stage, in the carry output? And can something be done to increase the overall speed of this ripple carry adder. And this is the question which we will try to answer in the next lecture. Thank you.